Oh, my darklings. Tonight is a night that could live in infamy. We're going outside. We're going to the backwoods for some horror stories and Bigfoot. And you know me, your intrepid host, Dave Schrader. I am an avid indoorsman. I don't like the outdoors. It's sticky, dirty, pointy, and things want to bite me out there. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. From ghosts to UFOs, aliens, Bigfoot, beasts, and beyond, Brian King Sharp, our guest, when we return to the very best in paranormal programming. I'm Dave Schrader, and this is my Paranormal 60. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps... Baloney, perhaps not. The Oregon Bigfoot Festival and Beyond is back and bigger than ever. At Oaks Amusement Park, Saturday, June 29th. Meet Bigfoot hunters like Ronnie LeBlanc of Discovery Channel's Expedition Bigfoot and Paranormal Caught on Camera. And paranormal investigators like me, Dave Schrader of The Holzer Files and the Paranormal 60 Podcast. Join us for a day of family fun celebrating Bigfoot ghosts, UFOs, and everything beyond. You never know what you'll find. Don't miss the Oregon Bigfoot Festival and Beyond, Saturday, June 29th at Oaks Amusement Park. Get tickets today at OregonBigfootFest.com. OregonBigfootFest.com. The Oregon Bigfoot Festival. Oregon Bigfoot Festival. Oh, welcome back to the program, my little lovelies. We've got a great one lined up for you tonight. Going out of my comfort zone. Of course, the comfort zone being homes loaded with ghosts and demonic activity. That's my safe space. But no, no, no. Today we're going outdoors. Outdoors. Why, you ask? I don't know, to be honest with you. But we're going to find out. And we've got a lot of stories to tell. And I thought, well, who best to walk us through this? And ladies and gentlemen, after reading this man's very impressive resume, I might have to step back and, and relinquish my lead as the hardest working man in the paranormal field because he hosts. Sasquatch Odyssey and that Bigfoot podcast and Backwoods Horror Stories and True Crime Odyssey. He is here with us this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Brian, thank you so much for being here, sir. It is my pleasure, Dave. I'm fanboying a little bit. I went live on the socials and said, I love Dave Schrader. I've been listening to you forever, man. And it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. So, well, thank you. Boy, you've got a, a pretty impressive background and, and have certainly seen a lot. First of all, you are former law enforcement. So thank you very much for serving and uh, helping to serve and protect your communities. We appreciate that. But I love when I can talk to police or former police and military and that they take their investigative skills and talents. And, and once they have the chance, they take them outside of normal investigative reasoning and goes out looking for things like the supernatural. Uh, to give our audience a little bit of a, a taste and a hint about you, by the way, folks, there are links for our guest. Uh, I put in his little link tree so you can find everything you need to on today's program guide. Tell us a little bit uh, about you and the experiences that got you open and involved into exploring not just criminal law, but uh, going outside and starting to make sense of the the high strangeness of this world around us. It seemed from a very early age, the high strangeness sort of found me. I grew up listening to stories. My mom grew up in some haunted houses and was always very open to the fact that those things were going on. So at a very early age, I was exposed to that. And it really started happening for me personally when we moved into a house when I was around, I think, 10 or 11. And there had been some, we lived in a very small town. I mean, there was literally like one stop sign. There wasn't, I don't even think we had a caution light in this town in North Georgia, very small town. So everybody knew everybody else. And there was some stories about the people who had lived in this house before we got there. There was a couple of brothers that lived there and we rented the house from the father of these two boys that had lived there before us, young men who had lived there. 
And there was tales of demonic activity, Satan worship, and those kind of things. So going in, we were sort of jaded to, there, there might be something going on here, but it wasn't really something that I even considered because I was really young. But those experiences started very early on for me in the house. I was hearing voices. I was hearing scratching on the walls. I was waking up to dark figures standing over my bed at night, night terrors, those kind of things. I love so, how you're just, uh, you just kind of wave right I woke up to dark figures standing over my bed and, you know, just like it was nothing, Brian, uh, walk me through that. What, what did the figures look like? How can you uh, explain them to us? Well, it was a long time ago, so I'll do the best I can to recall, but there was only a couple of times that happened. The majority of what I was experiencing was the feeling of constantly being watched or something around another presence in the house when nobody was there or I was alone in my room, those kind of things. And the dark figure thing, I think it only happened maybe three to four times over the course of probably three years, but I would wake up to this feeling of something being in the room with me and at the foot of the bed or very near the foot of the bed would just be this big dark figure. You know, it's dark at night in your room. The lights are off. That's how we, most people sleep. And it's very difficult to explain. I've only tried to explain it a couple of times because frankly, I don't get asked this question very often. I've guessed it on a ton of podcasts, but it's usually about Bigfoot. It's not about my experiences earlier on, but it was the darkest of darks is the only way I can really describe it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you see something that's really dark and then there's a darker area inside the darkness. That's what this figure looked like. I could tell that it was something. I didn't know what it was. I still to this day, obviously don't know what it was, but I was petrified. I literally could not move. And I was just, it was, it was just one of those things that scared me to death. There was plenty of times during the course of those two to three years that this was going on. I would go and sleep in the floor of my parents' bedroom on their, I would drag a blanket in there and I, because I didn't want to be alone in my house. And I was hearing what sounded like voices. I would hear whispering, nothing that you could ever make out. It was just kind of this kind of thing. I'm thinking, am I crazy? I've got to be crazy, right? This can't be happening. There's got to be some other explanation. I was early on Occam's razor, right? I was very critical thinking, even in my early years, I wanted to believe in some of these things, but I was trying to figure out what it could possibly be outside of more likely what it is now in retrospect. But mm -hmm. those experiences really sort of shaped my understanding that there was something more going on. And I've learned since then. And there was a lot of things going on. I know you've done a lot of paranormal investigating way more than I have, but I've done some digging in and I, I know there's a lot of things with like prepubescent boys and girls that experience a lot of things. I was in those years that were going on. There was some things going on. My dad was into alcohol and drugs there was a lot of turmoil going on. And I think, I think there was some sort of entity or something going on in that house that was feeding on that negativity is what mm. I feel now in retrospect. And my dad, again, he was taking a lot of pills and drinking a lot, but there was times that I learned after we moved out of that, even in my adulthood, my mom told me that he had confided in her. A lot of times he was experiencing a lot of the same things that I was experiencing. We just didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about it then. I didn't talk about it, obviously, until way later on. And yeah, it was, it was, uh, that was sort of the beginning. And of course, like most kids my age, I had interest. Like I loved Nessie. The Loch Ness Monster was my first cryptid that I fell in love with. And then when I was 12, I was out hunting. We had a lot of land. We didn't own anything. We were extremely poor. We really well, hold, hold on one second, Brian. Just hold that thought. I, I have to reel you back for a second to go back to your experience. And I'll, I'll explain why in a few seconds. But when you see these beings in your room, these darker than dark beings, uh, although you can't make out any specifics of them, was it associated with sounds, a smell, any other senses that were engaged? And I know you said that you heard whispering and things, but was that in conjunction with the viewing of these beings? The only thing that was in conjunction with those and what I remember at least the two to three times out of the possible four times this happened over a, a number of years was a scratching sound that I, it always seemed like it was coming from behind my bed mm -hmm. in that area, like scratching, like almost something scratching either on the outside of the house or inside the wall is probably more accurate to say. And that's the only thing I can remember that would be associated with the being because 
the being standing there didn't wake me up. It was a sound or some sort of stimuli that woke me up for me to see this being is how I recall it. So, but and yeah. when you saw it, was it towering over you? Was it hulking in mass or was it just long, skinny, lanky, creepy, shadowy figures? It was more of a, I was, like I said, I was probably 10, 11 at this time. So it would, I would say six feet, seven foot tall as mm-hmm. as big as I remember it being. And it was more of an outline of a man's figure. It wasn't okay. anything that I recall being weird, quote unquote, other than a, a dark figure standing at, right. the, at the end of my bed. But I, I don't recall feeling that it was something strange or weird. It was just really, really scary. I had this really intense fear of what I don't know. Just, I guess the unknown of whatever this was at the edge of the bed or at the end of the bed. And I was just petrified. And of course, a lot of people have said to me that I have told the story. Oh, you were just dreaming. You know, it was, it was sleep paralysis. That's a very common thing that people experience. But I recall being very wide awake. I was Mm -hmm. not asleep when I was seeing this. My eyes were open. I was experiencing through my eyes and that feeling of being absolutely petrified. The reason I ask is, you know, something I've never really dabbled in or or talked to some of my Bigfooter friends about, but some have had shadow-like figure encounters, strange things that have happened. And as you're talking to me about this large shadowy figure in your room, of course, I'm looking over your shoulder on your imagery and you've got this long shadowy figure of a a Sasquatch uh, that's back there and, and you're hearing scratching outside and inside the walls. And I often, you know, I, I wonder how many of these people were coming into connection with a transcendental communication with these creatures long before they even knew it projections of these beings that may have an interest in you. We always think it's us finding an interest in them, but maybe there's something like aliens being drawn to some families and not others. Maybe there's something that brings these big footers out and, and something that is equally interested in them. That's a very interesting point. I guessed it on a show probably three years ago. And the host of that show was into demonology and the occult and those kind of things. And one of the experiences that I had when I was around 12 was outside in the woods while I was hunting, I believe possibly now looking back, knowing what I know now, I may have been paced out of the woods, bluff charged and huffed at growled, growled at by possibly a Sasquatch. Hmm. And I, I went through that experience with him and I told him what I experienced. I didn't see what it was. It was very thick undergrowth in that area. I couldn't see. It was just outside of my field of vision. And what I experienced felt very realistic. It felt very animalistic. It felt very real flesh and blood. And when I told him the story, he said to me, you know, is it possible that what was going on inside your house, the experiences you were having with this possible entity, do you think it's possible that it wasn't a Sasquatch you were dealing with, but it may have been this entity that followed you into these woods. And I just, that really stuck with me. And that was three years ago. And I still think about those words. And I think, I don't know. I can't say definitively what it was. I've never said and never will say definitively that it was a Sasquatch that I had an encounter with, but it's a possibility. I'm open to those possibilities one way or the other. And I've never really had anybody say it may have been, Sasquatch related with what I was experiencing in the house. I don't know. Interesting. Well, I know there's, there's an interesting faction of people that believe that Bigfoot is in fact supernatural as a being that it is ghost like or interdimensional where it can be there one minute gone the next, um, and, and portray itself in a, a myriad of different ways. That's what was kind of striking me about it, but I'll, I'll start talking to other Bigfooters that I know and start seeing if there's any other correlations and, and, thread that we're seeing between people that have had or I witnessed these creatures and other elements of the supernatural. Um, it'd be, it'd be fascinating to, to note because there are many people that have had experiences with aliens and I believe it started at a young age and continued on through their life. If these beings are studying us, it might behoove them to know how we react under moments of stress and duress and fear And would some of these projections of these 
shadowy like figures, Bigfoot like creatures, uh, sea beasts, you know, things like that. That might be an interesting way to gauge the element of, of how humanity will respond if they make their presence known and, uh, just, you know, kind of a, kind of a light bulb moment there for me, but let's, let's go in. Uh, and I want, I want to make a quick mention too, that, uh, that our guest do, does, uh, Brian King sharp has a book called Sasquatch unleashed the truth behind the legend. And, uh, we'll have a link for that up on today's program guide. So you can find that book, get it for yourself. And again, remember to rate and review the books. Once you've had a chance to read them, honest ratings and reviews are always great for the authors so that their books get opened up on a lot of these different, um, profiles and shops, the more ratings and reviews you get, the more those organizations back your book and expose it to other uh, readers. So going forward, um, what about UFOs? I mean, you had these shadowy like figure encounters, you were out in the woods hearing what sounds like the quintessential Bigfoot, um, encounter, even though it may not have been something that you physically saw, you could tell there was something near you. Uh, what about aliens or UFOs? Is that something that's alien to you as well? Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, depending on the way you want to look at it, it is definitely not something that's alien to me because when I was 16, I had an experience with my mom. We had moved into a different area of North Georgia. We were probably 45 minutes or so away from the, the house that I was just talking about. And my mom had went out to the store. It was during the summer. I think it was probably July or August. And she had went out to the stores pretty late at night, I think probably 10, 1030. And I was on the phone with a school friend and we were talking and we had just gotten a cordless phone as one of those cordless phones with the big extra long uh, antenna, right. and it like it was yesterday. And my mom was out and I was kicked back having this conversation and she came in and she was white as a sheet and she's like, you need to come outside. You need to come outside now. I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I'm on the phone. And she's like, hang the phone up and come outside now. And my mom doesn't act like that. She's a very calm, under pressure. You know, she raised two kids by herself and just th this lady didn't act like that. So I, I knew something was up. So I hang up the phone and we walk into the backyard and she just walks out and she points up and she says, she didn't say a word. And I look up and there is this, it's probably, I've estimated six to 800 feet in diameter, silver metallic craft, probably it's hard for me to estimate. I would say probably less than a thousand feet off the ground. I mean, it was huge, no lights, no sound, mm. nothing but the moonlight reflecting off of it. And it was very, it almost looked liquid like I, I, it's really difficult to explain, but there was no creases in the metal. There was no rivets there. It, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And it's moving very slowly and it's moving back away behind. There was a ridge behind the area where we lived and we just watched it move across the sky and float down over the back of the treetops and the ridge and disappear. And we just stood there in awe. I, I'd never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it since. I've had other experiences where I've seen UAPs, but I have not seen anything that close and that massive and unexplainable. So, Any missing time after uh, witnessing that with your mother? No, no, no missing time. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I've had conversations. I've had people like Preston Dennett on my show in the past and Preston's big in the UFO community. Right. He's interviewed tons of people. He's written tons of books about UFOs. And I, I explained my situation with Preston and he scared me a little bit. He said, you know, very few people have that close of an encounter with an alien craft and that be the first time or the last. And you may have had things that you don't even remember. And I'm like, goodness. I don't even want to think about that, but it was kind of scary. I mean, it was really something that we had clearly never had any kind of experience like that. And my mom is one of these people. She's like me. She wants to know answers. So she immediately started calling radio stations, the local radio station to see if anybody had called it in. She called the police department. And I think she finally dug in and maybe found a couple of other people that had said they saw something. But other than that, it was just 
kind of like a, a nothing burger and we just kind of moved on from it. And it's something we've always shared and talked about. And I've, you know, revisited even throughout doing some of the interviews and talking to so many people like I have for Sasquatch Odyssey is all about encounters. It's an encounters based podcast. So, and I used to do that thing where I think cops, people in general like to put things in boxes. It makes it easier for us to understand. Mm -hmm. And I like to check boxes and put things over here. And I would have conversations with people who were having Bigfoot activity. And I'm a very flesh and blood. I'll just put it out there. Anybody who listens to my show knows I'm a very flesh and blood oriented researcher when it comes to Bigfoot. I think if these things do exist and I'm about 90% there on the fact that they do exist, I think there's some sort of a relic tominoid and it's flesh and blood. Maybe has some weird things going on that's associated, maybe some things they can do that we don't know about. But in general, that's, that's where I'm at. But I would talk to people who would have very flesh and blood experiences, even borderline habituation situations on their property and they would see orbs and they would see what looked like craft and they would have these weird lights and all these other things. And I used to go, okay, well, you know, that's weird that you're having this, but I don't think it's related to Bigfoot. And I would put it in a box over here. And the more I've talked to people, the more I've moved the needle on, I think it might be connected in some way. I just don't know how. And that's one of the things Preston has said to me many times, Brian, everything's connected it's all connected. <laughs> Every time I would hear that, I'd go, okay, yeah, you may be right. So the more I, I think about it and some of the other experiences I've had, even as recently as, you know, in the last six months or so, it's almost impossible to believe that it's not connected on some level. I, I just don't know. I don't know what else to think. Well, let's do this. We're going to take a very quick break. We'll come back and let's hear about some of these more recent encounters and explorations that you've been a part of. And then I want to start getting into some of the, uh, obviously with your backwoods horror and, and terror kind of stories, I, I would like to go into that and hear some of the creepiest tales that you can share with our audience. They love that stuff. We'll cover that and more when we return. This is Dave Schrader and the Paranormal 60. Brian King Sharp is our guest this evening, and he is the author of a brand new book that's out and available called Sasquatch Unleashed, The Truth Behind the Legend. And uh, we got a link up for that on today's program guide, as well as links to find Brian and his podcasts, of which there are many. So whether you are a true crime, a Bigfoot, or a, just a spooky story aficionado, this is the guy you want to follow going forward. Um, Brian, you have spent a long time investigating these kind of claims, hearing these stories. Uh, I'm just curious, what are some of the more recent developments for you? I guess the some of the weirder stuff for me was we lived, I was a city of Atlanta police officer. We were living in the city of Atlanta, very urban area, right? There's not a whole lot of Bigfoot activity and things going on in the city of Atlanta. But I've always wanted to live simpler. We wanted to live and have property of our own. So we started looking for that and we ended up purchasing 40 acres in 2017 here in the foothills of North Carolina. And honestly, you know, people have asked me plenty of times and my goal was to purchase property in an area where there was a possibility of Sasquatch activity. Mm -hmm. I knew it was a long shot, right? Because I still didn't believe 100% that these things were real. And so we bought this property and it, I guess it was probably a couple of years after we purchased the property before we were here full time. And the first summer or first winter, fall, winter so season that we went into full time here, we live in a 400 square foot tiny house. So it's a very tiny space. So we have a lot of outdoor activities and a lot of outdoor space. Obviously we put a hot tub outside. And the first thing that happened was sitting outside in the hot tub, and hearing vocalizations in the distance. Now we have 40 acres here, but there's hundreds and hundreds of acres around us. Our nearest neighbors are probably three quarters to a mile away. So there's nothing but land around us. And on the ridge or beyond the ridge behind us is when we would hear this Ohio howl. If you guys are familiar with the Matt Moneymakers Ohio howl, I think from 92 or 94 that Matt rec recorded in Ohio. It was very similar to that but it was probably a mile, mile and a half away. You know, you hear that kind of stuff and you're like, oh, that's, that's weird. You know, it's probably some kind of animal that we haven't heard yet, or we're not familiar with, what have you. And you just kind of chalk it up. 
And then fast forward, I guess that went on. We heard those several times throughout that winter season. We'd go out almost every night after work and relax in the hot tub. And then I was, I started the show. I posted the first episode of Sasquatch Odyssey, February of 2021. So we're probably in March or so of 21. I'd finished up a couple of interviews that day. I was doing some show notes before bed. We, it was a beautiful night outside. It was probably 50 degrees. We had the windows open and we sleep in a loft upstairs and we're doing some reading and I'm doing show notes and probably 50 yards away from the house in the woods. We hear a very similar Ohio howl type vocalization with a sort of a, like a bark on the end of it really weird. And it was so loud. Again, you, you hear this in the proverbial Sasquatch encounters. People say you feel the sound. It's louder than anything I've ever experienced before. And it's, that's truly the experience that we had. I felt it in my chest and it scared the crap out of me. I'm not going to lie. I was <laughs> like, did like, what, what was that? I better have like, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, what do you think it was? Well, I don't know. You, you, we had this back and forth and I'm like, what could it have been? It was either a person or it was a Sasquatch. That's just, just where I've came down. And I'll be honest with you in the area we're in, in South Car- in North Carolina, you don't sneak on other people's property. You just don't do that. It's not one of those things. It's not a safe thing for you to do. Right. Right. So I don't think there was a person 50 yards away from us in our woods making this noise. And again, I've never said definitively that it was a Sasquatch. I never will because I didn't see what made the sound, but it's well, certainly certain. not in your area, right? I mean, people have guns hunting. You've got those woods. If you're going to stand out there making guttural animal noises that could be a danger to you or your pets or any livestock you keep, yeah, that's a real dumb idea to just be out there pranking someone. Yeah, I agree. So I don't think it was a person. I don't know what it is. I still can't explain it to this day, but then we had some other weird things. We walked the dogs in the same I, area. Right, I do have to tell you. I, I, all honesty, I've been in places where I've heard growls come from rooms that there are no one there. These kind of creepy guttural growls that are really unnerving. Um, and although it alarms me, it's kind of like, whoa, what the, what could, and your brain starts going into that spiral mode of trying to understand, like you said, compartmentalize. What was that? Was that a car squeal a couple blocks away and it just came through and it sounded like it was coming from this room? And it was that growl. You you try to understand that. But I promise you, Brian, if I live on 40 acres of wooded area and something starts <laughs> out in my yard, and if I'm out there, I'm done. I'm cooked. I just know I will lay down <laughs> in the field position and just be ready to be eaten. I'm pretty sure that's how it's going to go down for me. When you hear something that sounds that formidable, that big, whether it's a Sasquatch, a human, or a bear outside your window, how do you mentally just be okay with that? I've, I've got to know. Well, it helps being a, a big city cop because I dealt with so much stuff. It's so easy to say, okay, that happened. That was weird. That was horrible. But you just kind of compartmentalize it and you move on. And that's kind of what I did with it because I didn't want to believe that. And I'll be honest, I'll be 100% frank. And anybody who's followed me for any amount of time, some of the other things I'm going to talk about here in a second, I really struggled with even talking about publicly because I'm the guy who does a Bigfoot podcast. And now I just happen to buy 40 acres and I have possible Sasquatch activity on my property. Mm, Isn't that convenient? And I'm perfectly aware of that because I'm, I'm, I pull no qualms about calling hoaxers out, right? That's right. part of my, my thing. I call but people. There's an element hoax. to what we do, Brian, that's synchronistic. It's we're drawn to listen. I, I Oh, good luck. Dave just happens to live in haunted houses for most of his life. There may be something about that, that draws those of us that have a fascination and an interest into something like this. We don't realize I rented a house down the street. I didn't know it was haunted when I rented it. It just started to evolve. Was I bringing spirits in because of my involvement outdoors and, and, you know, doing live events? I can't tell you, I don't have that ability to look back and recognize where that ghost came from. But I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and it's like, um, Cliff from, you know, uh, finding Bigfoot and such. He, 
he owns property where they have Bigfoot encounters. And it's like, oh yeah, you're right. Isn't that, oh, that's just very convenient, but it's not. I think there's a reason we're drawn to certain places and certain things. And there's this synchronistic effect that starts to come into play. And I think that because we start to pay attention to those things, it opens us up to see more of the high strangeness that's going on around us as well. I want to make a mention, Ristol throws two bucks at us with a super sticker. Remember, super like, super stickers are on, and he recommends Brian's book as well. He said it's a great read. So thanks for bringing that up and letting us know about that, Ristol. We appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I think that's where my bravery would end is, you know, and I don't know why it's stupid, right? We've seen the exorcist. We've seen every horror movie and how the demons can fling us around like a rag doll. Something less frightening to me about that and ghosts than there is to open my door and see this maybe eight to 10 foot tall, hairy bipedal hominid that just seems like an apex predator to me. And especially because over the last decade, and I don't know what your findings are, Brian, it sure seems like they've gotten a lot more aggressive towards people in the stories that I hear, as opposed to just being the benevolent keeper of the woods. These things seem to be getting more aggressive and the encounters more tenuous. Yeah, I definitely agree. There's so much to unpack there. I'm glad you said a couple of things. Cliff is actually a good friend of mine. He wrote the forward to my book. If, if you guys pick up the book, you'll get a forward from Cliff Barrickman. And that's one of the things Cliff and I have talked about. You know, I, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm the kind of person I, I want to be as open as I can about my experiences, very much like Cliff. He makes no bones about his experiences. And he's one of the most above board people I've ever met in my life. If, if you right. don't know Cliff personally, he's one of the greatest people I've ever met. He's one of these lifelong friends that I would have never met had it not been for Bigfoot. But that's one of the conversations we had. And I just decided to put it out there because I found some other weird things. But back to that situation with the vocalization so close to the house. I had conversations with people. Doug Highcheck from Monster Quest is a good friend of mine. Right. I told Doug, I sent him a text and said, Doug, this this happened. He's like, what, did you go check it out? No, I didn't. I had no intentions of stepping outside the door and seeing <laughs> what it possibly was. I am not that dude. I'm not doing that. But Brian, I, you're the big city cop. That's smart enough not to open the door and go outside and encounter a possible. Exactly. That's it. Well, Dave, you're the big badass ghost hunter. Right. But I know that if there's something I can't handle or I'm afraid is outside of my pay grade, I definitely know how to refer people and delegate them to, I'm going to call Cliff and have him come investigate this. <laughs> yeah. I want Cliff and Bobo on my property and taking care of the Bigfoot for me. Yeah. And I'll just go and look later. But it's important <laughs> to remember that, you know, a lot of people, they, they Monday morning quarterback, anything, you know, you've had plenty of paranormal experiences and things like that. Everybody Monday morning quarterbacks and says, Oh, well you should have, well, you know, you weren't in the situation. So right, it's hard to say what you would have done. And I certainly don't do that to people because I've had my own situations like that one that I didn't go outside and, and take a look, but other things started happening on the property. We had, I had this weird turtle shell show up on a stump on an area where we walk the dogs every day that, was really strange. This bleached white turtle shell was turned into a stump and stuck into the side of it. We had some weird things with apples that I put out being bitten, like on a stick, it was picked up and like a human bite out of this apple and it was placed back in the stump. It just a myriad of things. And then I found footprints. There was the first footprint that I found was last summer. We were on a hike. I was getting away from Bigfoot. I do tons of Bigfoot podcasts. I do tons of stuff related to Bigfoot. I just wanted to go hike my woods. I wasn't even going to take my phone on this hike with me. And Danny and I go out into the woods to hike. And I'm hiking along. We're probably 20 minutes into this hike. It was a new area of our property. We'd never hiked before. And I look down. I'm crossing this little area of what it's not really a creek, but there's some standing water because we'd had rain the day before and we were getting more rain. There's probably about an inch and a half of standing water in this area. And I step over and I look down and I go, Oh, that's, that's cool. It looks like a, that's like a pareidolia footprint, right? I'm like, I'm laughing. Cause it kind of, I'm like, man, that looks like a Sasquatch footprint. That's really cool. I'm going to take a picture of that because I want to show it to people and say, look how this can look, but it's not really a footprint. So I get my phone out of my pocket and I start getting down lower and I'm looking and I'm like, Oh, that looks like five toes. Oh, it looks like it slid here and the front is pressed in more in the mud than the back. And it's about 16 inches long. Oh, wow. That looks like a Bigfoot footprint. 
So I take a couple of pictures of it and I move on and we found some other weird stuff. Some looks like possible stick structures and some fulcrum type things and just weird stuff that I took some photos of. And I, I, I really didn't think a whole lot about it. I got back to where we had service and the Wi-Fi, and I sent it to, I texted it to Doug Highcheck and I said, Doug, just, just putting this out there. What does that look like to you? No context. And Doug said, oh, it looks like a Bigfoot footprint. Where, where'd you get this picture? And I said, I just took it on my property, dude. <laughs> He's like, wow. And it, or it looks like, and Doug being Doug, if you know, Doug, he, he looks at things from 15 different angles. He said, it looks more like it could be a possible handprint. And he starts pointing out where he thought the thumb could be and some other things. And I thought, that's kind of weird. And I, I eventually put it out on social media and people were saying, oh man, that's, that looks like a Sasquatch footprint. I kind of chalked it up and left it at that. And I did a speaking event. It was last year in Idaho and Cliff was there. Uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum was there. I think Michael Freeman was there. We're all having dinner and then we have our event and then we go out for a drink afterwards. And I'm talking to Cliff and Michael and them. And I said, I, I just handed Cliff my phone and I said, look at these pictures I took. I'm just curious what you think. Cause he, he knows a lot about footprints and he scrolls through and he looks at this picture of what I thought was a pareidolia footprint. And he said, that looks like a Sasquatch footprint, dude. Did you cast that? And I'm like, no, I didn't cast it. I didn't have any casting material. It'd been raining. It was in water. He's like that that's definitely a Bigfoot footprint, man. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. So since let, then, let me just mention real quickly for listeners that are hearing this term used a couple times tonight, you may not be familiar. Pareidolia. Pareidolia is when you look at an oil stain on the wall and it looks like Jesus Christ, or, uh, you know, you, you can see an image in the wood grain on your paneling, uh, your eyes, your brain are always looking for making sense of random patterns. And sometimes we can look at a spot on the ground and it looks like a footprint when it in fact is nothing more than just a rutted out piece of ground. And, uh, but the more you looked at this, so when you're hearing the word pareidolia, he's saying he looked at it thinking, oh yeah, it's easy to think that that's what I'm looking at as a Bigfoot. Uh, you were trying to dismiss it as opposed to, wow, we got a big footprint right up front, right? It was more of a funny ha ha moment for you than it was an oh my God moment. Yeah, I was completely Occam's razor. It's got to be something else. It's got to be pareidolia. It's not a Bigfoot footprint, but then I have somebody that I respect greatly who has looked at next to Jeff. I mean, Jeff Meldrum, I mean, close probably the number two guy that I would go to anything Bigfoot footprint related mm -hmm. foot morphology and saying if something's fake or real or what have you. And he's telling me, no, dude, that's, you should have cast that. That's one of the best footprint pictures I've ever seen. And I'm like, oh my goodness, could it be real? And at this point it starts becoming real because all the other stuff is very subjective. You know, the turtle shell being stuck in the side of a stump, just randomly weird stuff. This human looking bite out of an apple that I'd placed out there. And if you guys want to see this, it's all on my Instagram. It's been out there and it'll be in perpetuity for people to look at. Uh, Bigfoot BKS, you can check it out on Instagram if you'd like. But all this stuff is sort of objective, subjective. But when you start finding footprints, that's physical traces of something tangible. Then it started getting real for me and I cast a couple of other footprints on the property. And, and there's actually pictures that I've never put out of footprints that I've cast here on the property as recently as about four months ago. And they were 65 yards from our house and they're like 15 inch five toed footprints of something. I, 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 I will not say it's Sasquatch, but I don't know what it is. And then I've, I've hiked my, neighbor's property. There's a couple of photos in the book there of a huge teepee structure. That's probably, I don't know, nine, 10 feet tall that there's actually a picture in the book of Danny standing under it sort of for scale. And, uh, I, I don't have any explanation for that. And I cast two footprints on his property that I found on a random hike again with, we were out with three other neighbors, not doing any Bigfoot research. We were just out hiking the property. We'd never hiked that area before. And I found two footprints that I went back and cast. And those pictures are also in the book that you can see. So just a lot of weird stuff. Again, I've never said anything definitive and never will because, you know, I've had other experiences. I went up to Radium, BC, Canada last year, went on an expedition with Todd Standing for seven days. 
had a ton of weird things, saw a bunch of UFOs while I was up there on that expedition, heard some wood knocks, heard some what sounded like samurai chatter. We heard whoops. We got rocks thrown at us a couple of different times and found some really weird, huge tree structures. I mean, some of the weirdest stuff I've ever found in my life. And again, there's, there's something to this. I just, I haven't had the right. definitive class A sighting. And it's kind of frustrating because I want it to be real so bad, but I have to hold out that little bit of skepticism in me. I don't know what it is exactly that just keeps me teetering on that edge, but I've moved from five days out of seven to about six and a half days out of seven. I believe that there's, there's more to this than I, I used to think. And for those of you that aren't familiar, look up, uh, especially on YouTube and a couple different sites, look up Bigfoot Samurai Chatter. It's this recordings of these voices that sound very much like an old samurai movie. When you hear these things, they're these kind of guttural, you'll hear some of the whoops and hollers, and then you hear this, and it's like very fast sounding samurai talk. So uh, go listen to them. They're, they can be really compelling and also really, really eerie. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. Let's get into some uh, some creepy backwood stories and some of the weirder encounters that our guest has collected over the years. We'll do that when we return right here to the Paranormal 60. All right, my friends, my book bundle is out and available now. You can get not one, but both of my books, signed copies available right on my website. Just contact me or go straight to paranormal60.com. That's paranormal60.com. And on the front page, scroll down, you'll find our book bundle there. We're also adding the book bundle to our shop portion. You get the other side, a teen's guide to ghost hunting and the paranormal and theater of the mind, my brand new book, Tales from the Darkness, real life encounters with the strange and supernatural. Got over 111 amazing reviews right now on Amazon. And if you've bought the book, please make sure to go rate and review it. And if you have not yet, pick up the book that everybody else is talking about. Get yourself either the Theater of the Mind book by itself or get the bundle package on my site right now for just $40 for the signed set. That's the bundle package. You'll find it right on paranormal60.com. It's the only way to get both books signed and get them from me. It'll also save you on shipping and handling, so check that out. In winter's grasp, a chilling tale unfolds. Wanted Magazine's Issue 40, Secrets to be Told. Al Capone's ghost, in shadows it creeps. A spectral mobster, where darkness seeps. Fourteen signs of a poltergeist's might. Haunting whispers in the silent night. Pascagoula UFO, fifty years gone by. A cosmic encounter reaching the sky. A ghost train of Tate Bridge echoes in the mist. A phantom journey where souls exist. Wanted Magazine Issue 40 is out now. Available from selected outlets and bit.ly forward slash haunted magazine. Don't be normal, be paranormal. Hey kids, make sure to go check out the Paranormal 60 Swag Shop. We've got a lot of great items there, including our new Scaro graphic tees. Available only at the Paranormal 60 Swag Shop. So go to the Paranormal 60 Swag Shop or Paranormal60.com and click on the shop button above, you'll find information there. And our new Scaro shirts include a Mothman t-shirt, Nessie, the Alien, Ghosts, uh, Sasquatch, and Dogman shirts. We'll be adding more to our Scaro graphic tees as time progresses. But go get the very first set. The first run of t-shirts are out and available now. Multiple colors, multiple sizes, whatever you're looking for, you'll find them there. You'll also find our Squatch and Stitches collection. That is t-shirts for Bigfoot in every vein. Go check it out for yourself. We've got mugs, cups, glasses, wallets, t-shirts, hoodies, all kinds of fun and exciting paraphernalia. You can find it at paranormal60swagshop.com. And a last mention today, the Festival of the Unexplained is coming up this September 
2024 in England. So if you've been waiting to finally make your way over to merry old England, this is a great reason to come because it is the only time you will see Shane Pittman, Cindy Kaza, and myself, Dave Schrader, all from the Holzer Files, all together in the UK for the Festival of the Unexplained, along with my good friend, haunted historian Neil Story. He'll be at the conference, but let's say you want to stretch that trip out and have a little bit more fun. We'll enjoy the unexplainable with our Supernatural Eerie England tour with me and Neil Story. We're going to be visiting some of the most haunted locations associated with vampires, ancient energies, folklore creatures, ghosts, hauntings, and more. Included in the stop, you get a chance to see some of the most amazing sites like the Hellfire Caves and Stonehenge. And you get that with both Neil and I. And as part of that package, that entire tour from September 15th to the 25th, you get to attend the Festival of the Unexplained. It is part of that package tour, and you'll be a part of that event with us. For more information, go check out darknessevents.com. All right, we are here. Brian King Sharp is our guest. Let's show him that book again. And remember, if you're looking for podcasts on Bigfoot, you can check out his Sasquatch Odyssey podcast, that Bigfoot podcast, also Backwoods Horror Stories, True Crime Odyssey, and don't forget his new book, Sasquatch Unleashed, The Truth Behind the Legend. Those are all available, but let's reel it back here. Backwoods Horror Stories. All right, let's hear some of your favorite creepy, weird, supernatural tales that you can share with us that'll definitely keep me out of the woods again for the next 50 years of my life. I think some of the the ones that have stuck out to me and the, the secret sauce for Backwoods Horror Stories was we wanted to do something that I, I've read stories over on Sasquatch Odyssey. Obviously, the main crux of that show is having people on sharing things in their own words, but there are a lot of people who don't want to do that for whatever reason they don't right. want to come on. They don't want to share their story and, and be seen or heard. So I started that channel specifically for those people who wanted to just email in or send us in their stories and talk about them. And I tell you some of the things that have stuck out to me in the short time we've been doing, I think we're only 30 episodes into the show are some of the dog man stories that have stuck out. And there was one in particular of a, a situation where a guy was out in an area in the land between the lakes and stumbled across. We just covered that on Monday's show. Please continue on. Yeah. We, we, Wayne and I, my co host on that Bigfoot podcast, we're trying to get out there this summer. We wanted to go out and do a little documentary film in the land between the lakes. It's, I've had tons of people on that have had Bigfoot and Dogman encounters from the land between the lakes. So it's, it holds a special place in my heart. But this story in particular, this guy was out in this area and stumbled across, unfortunately, a person that, had been killed by what he believes to be a dog man. And he sees this creature and it ends up having some sort of a, I guess, fight to the death with a Sasquatch. It was a really in-depth experience. And it took me aback when I read the email because it actually came into Wayne and Wayne forwarded it over to me. And he's like, we got to talk about this on the show. And one of the things about that show is People ask me all the time, you know, obviously you get comments about the the stories that you share and say, oh, there's no way that's possibly true. It can't, it's got to be made up. And I'm thinking, okay, there's a lot of weird things that happen out there. And this person who sent this in was very believable. I, I, it's very impossible for us to vet these stories. We can't travel to these areas. We can't meet these people. We just put them out there and it's up to the audience to listen to the story, take what you want, leave the rest. You decide what you believe is true or what's not. But that one really resonated me with me because it really traumatized this guy. Like he had a really traumatizing experience with something that he can't explain. And that's one of the things that sticks out to me the most about some of these stories. Another one that comes to mind early on that we did on Backwoods Horror Stories was a, a lady sent in and she said in the email, I don't want to tell you where I'm at in Arkansas. She wouldn't tell us the city that she was in. She said, I'm a public figure in this town that I'm from. And she told a story of 
her grandparents farm and visiting her grandparents farm when they were kids and she remembered this prize bull that her grandfather had that he loved that he kept separate from the other herd and the kids were always enamored by this thing and they went the same time every summer they went on their parents anniversary so they knew they were going to get three days with their grandparents on this farm they loved to run in the woods and she told a story about this bull being there the summer before and then this summer they went something was different and the bull was missing and the first thing that happened when they got to the area that they loved to play in the woods as one of the reasons that they went there they loved their grandparents but they loved this farm and they loved the woods their grandfather set them down and said there's no going near the woods this year mm. we catch you going near the woods at all you're going to be put inside for the remainder of your trip with a butt whooping on the top of it right <clears throat> which really stuck out to her because her grandfather had never talked to them that way. And the one thing they noticed that was odd was this bull that he prized was gone. And when they asked the grandmother what happened to the bull, the bull passed away. It's buried somewhere on the farm. And she, she said in the email, she recalled thinking how big this bull was and how big this hole would have had to been on the farm. So fast forward, I think it was 2008, when her grandfather passed away, her grandmother was meeting with family members because this farm had been in the family for generations. She was going to pass away eventually, and she wanted to keep it in the family. So she was meeting with people that were interested in the family. She was going to sell it to them dirt cheap. If anybody was list interested, her husband and their children were interested in moving to the farm. So she had a conversation with her grandmother and said, we're very interested in this. This is something we've been talking about doing. If you want to sell the farm, we're all in. And her grandmother said, I can't sell you the farm without telling you the full truth. So mm -hmm. she sat her and her husband down and said, you know, you remember that summer that the bull went missing and your grandpappy told you that you can't go out in the woods. And she said, of course I do. Yeah, I remember that very well. It stuck out to me. And she said, there's a reason for that <clears throat> because her husband her grandfather had told her a story of going out and seeing his bull in the pasture and he saw what he called a wood booger come out of the woods grab this bull around the neck and snap its neck and then drag it into the woods dragged it off pulled it over the fence threw it over the fence and dragged it into the woods and the lady and her husband are listening to the story and she's taken aback obviously because her i mean her and she said in the email, you know, my grandmother was very trustworthy. She went to church every time the doors were open. And my grandfather told her the story and she had no reason to disbelieve her grandfather. Right. And then they're talking and she says, you know, well, that's interesting and weird, but is, I mean, is that the end of the story? And her grandmother's like, no, uh, after that happened, your granddad went out and got a bunch of his friends together and got an old fashioned posse basically. And they went out and hunted this thing down. And there is a, she said, and I, I believe it was almost 10 foot tall, Bigfoot buried on the farm in the back of the area where they thought the bull was buried and may still be. She wasn't sure about that, but that really stuck out to me because, and at the end of the story, she says, my husband, after, we heard the story that my grandmother told us about the Bigfoot. We have children. We don't want to move our children into an area where this is possibly something that's still in this area. So right. they chose not to buy the family farm because of that story. And I don't know whatever happened. I don't know if it got passed on to somebody else in the family, but that really stuck out to me because I read the email before I read the story on the air and I felt the... I felt the emotion behind that because that was something that was very important to her. It was important to her family to keep that in the family. But because of the story and what happened, she chose not to do that with the family farm. And that's something that sticks out and permeates, at least for me, I'm almost 450 plus episodes into Sasquatch Odyssey. And that's one of the things that's permeated for me. And I'm sure it's the same for you, Dave, when you deal with people with paranormal experiences is the emotion that comes with this. And the trauma that a lot of people don't see that happens with these experiences. And, and I think it's mostly PTSD for people who have firsthand experiences, but 
it's something that has really stuck out to me. And in, in some of these stories, like I said, the the one with Dog Man and this story in particular, there's other stories that uh, there was a gentleman that sent an email in about claiming to have shot a Sasquatch who was trying to take his daughter, his two or three year old daughter. Whoa. Yeah. This thing was stalking his family basically. And he ended up having to shoot it and kill it. And he was very adamant about the fact that, you know, a lot of people aren't going to understand this, but I did what I had to do to protect my family. So, you know, some of those stories seem like they're really far out there and they may be hard to believe, but honestly, I'll be, I'll be honest, I think they're probably more prevalent than we know because there's so many, for every one of those stories we hear, there's probably a hundred or more that we will never hear because people never come forward with those. So right. that's one of the things that I've tried to I- impress upon people for either coming on Sasquatch Odyssey and sharing their stories as difficult as it may be, or just sending them in for us to read on backwards horror stories and pass those stories on. I think there's so much to be gleaned from every one of those stories. There's so much data to collect there and it's so important to get the stories out there. So I try to encourage as many people as possible to come forward and tell those stories, whether people believe you or not, it really doesn't matter. If you know the truth, just tell the truth. Right. And somebody's going to hear that and maybe come forward and share their story as well. So I love that. Uh, You know, and it's interesting that you say you can kind of feel the vibe. You can pick up on what people are saying and how they're, they're talking. And of course, being in law enforcement, you probably became very acutely aware of when people are leaning into a lie or, uh, trying to cover part of the truth. I had a, uh, elderly woman who came to see me at one of the conferences and she asked me to step aside. She wanted to tell me about an encounter she had with a Sasquatch. And she started off very calm and talking to me. And as she was speaking, she started wringing her hands. She was shaking. Her voice started quaking and she just had tears streaming out. She was so terrified by the experience she had. And it was like a little red riding hood. Basically she literally was going through the woods from her place to her grandparents to visit And as she was going through, she heard something and she thought at first, maybe it was one of her friends or one of her friend's older brothers trying to spook her. She could tell it was big. Uh, That's why she thought it might've been one of the older brothers, maybe an adult that made her nervous as well, because, you know, obviously she's a little kid in the woods. And if somebody is stalking her, that was very unnerving. She said, and at one point she decided to hide, she was going to spring out and surprise them. So she ran up ahead a little bit and got behind this. Uh, little burrow of trees. And when she heard it walk up, she jumped around to scream at it. And when she screamed, it yelled back. And she said, this thing was massive. And at first it kind of jolted it and yelled back. And then she said, it just bared its teeth and it started coming towards her. He took off screaming and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just ran through the woods till she got to her grandfather and grandmother's house. And this woman, I asked her, I said, well, so how old were you? She goes, oh, I was maybe 10, 11 years old at the time. And I said, do you mind if I ask how old you are now? She got, I'm 68. And I said, interesting. Cause she, dude, it was like, she was reliving that traumatic moment. She was crying. She was shaking. She was so unnerved by what she encountered. She said she would not walk through the woods. If it took her an extra half an hour, she would walk all the roads to get from her house to her grandparents' house and back. She said, you couldn't have paid her enough to go back into those woods after that experience. Yeah. And you mentioned it earlier, the, the progression of some of the more aggressive encounters. And that's some of the things that I've tried to cover recently, more recently on the show, I had Fred who is a uh, native American from up in Alaska. And Fred came on the show a couple of months back and, and had some really aggressive encounters that he shared. I mean, he, and one of his elders and his cousin had to shoot their way out of a cabin when they were on a river up there doing some gold panning at the time. Wow! And I've since Fred has his own YouTube channel and he has shared a ton of experiences that he has gathered from other people. And I've started every week. I'm doing at least one show with Fred to share some of those more aggressive encounters from Alaska, because I think it's important for people to realize that these things may not be the friendly forest giants. And I'm certainly not by any stretch of the imagination saying that every Sasquatch is some bloodthirsty killer that's responsible for all the missing people in the world, right. or at least North America. 
But I think it's important to talk about that stuff and be realistic about the fact that if these things are animals, and I do believe they are, everybody, including humans, have the propensity to be very dangerous. So you got to keep your head on a swivel and just treat them like you're dealing with a big brown bear and be aware that something bad could happen if you're in the woods. Brian, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and we've got a We'll try to have you back on maybe every quarter, have you come back on and share some more Bigfoot encounters and, and other strange tales. Um, I've got to guess in the areas you've lived, there's got to be a pretty good creepy ghost story associated with the woods as well that you've heard that you could share with us on our way out. Do you have, do you have a ghostly encounter? Well, I tell you, there was uh, well, one that I recently had on Backwoods Horror Stories. I don't know if it's a ghost. It's more of sort of a Fresno Creeper sort of story. Oh, okay. It's very creepy. Fres if you've seen those pictures of the long arms or legs kind of story, these folks initially thought they were seeing a Sasquatch, and it turns out that it was more of this big, tall, ghostly, white figure of... I mean, I, I don't know anything other than to compare it to other than a Fresno crawler. I found that really interesting that, and they had some of the very similar experiences of being watched and some of the other things that are sort of quote unquote part of most of the Bigfoot encounters that you hear. But it turns out that this, this thing was white and transparent looking and I, I can't do it justice now because I don't have it in front of me. But if you check out Backwoods Horror Stories, it's called... Uh, the crawler, I believe, is the name of the episode. You can check it out. It's a really cool, creepy story. I think you you guys would enjoy it. Fantastic. Check it out. Check out all of the podcasts. Subscribe to them as well. Thank you so much, Brian King Sharp. We appreciate you being here this evening. It's been my honor and pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll have you back again soon. Uh, I'd love to hear your stories, folks. If you've had any strange encounters with beings that seem otherworldly, maybe even creatures that you've never heard talked about on any other show, that's how we got to know about those frog-like creatures and the bloody bones, man. Don't be afraid to share with me and I will share those stories online. I can do it anonymously so nobody knows who you are or where you are, but you can send those stories to me at Dave at paranormal 60. Dot com. That's Dave at Paranormal60.com, and it may be featured in an upcoming episode of the Paranormal 60. For those of you kind of confused by tonight, where are the Paranormal 60 news crew? Understand that my, my inclination for the show is to bring you the best possible programming that I can. And there are some guests that are harder to get for Mondays and are available on a Wednesday. So I'll take those guests when I can get them and relegating and moving things around from time to time is how it will be. There are also times when not everybody is available from the Paranormal 60 News crew. So I like to try to freshen it up and have some guests that'll come with and spend some time with us like tonight's guest, giving us kind of an uh, indoctrination to different views and stories than we might be hearing elsewhere. So I hope you'll be fine with that as we continue our journey together, bringing the light into the darkness with the information that we share here. And I want to thank you all again for bringing me along on your journeys and for allowing me into your lives and into your living rooms or cars, your headphones, however you may be listening to me. Please do me a favor, rate and review this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Because like all things now, everything's an algorithm. And the more response that these programs get, the more they get heard, the more they get exposed to a bigger, broader audience. And we would love to continually build our Darkling audience here in our community, get more people in here. And we encourage you, those of you that are listening to this podcast after the live broadcast, come join us one night, Monday or Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Central Time, as we investigate the strange and supernatural world around us. Well, that's it for this evening, folks. Stay frosty. Have a good one. And I'll be back again with you next Monday when we will return with a special edition of the Paranormal 60 News, and the entire crew and cast will be back in for that. That's Monday. It's a one-time Monday event. We're going to switch around from time to time, but Monday we'll be back with the Paranormal 60 News crew. Until then, I'm Dave Schrader, and thank you for visiting my Paranormal 60. Dumbest news of the day.